We were like a teenage band that a lot of people grew up with as teenagers, which is a very important phase in people's lives. And then we went on hiatus for five years. So it's like mm. kind of stuck in time for some people to some extent, which is which makes it even more important to like emphasize that there is like something worthwhile now with the band. Hiya, I'm Rishi and today I'm joined by Jack and Jamie from Bombay Bicycle Club for the latest in Enemies in Conversation. How was your weekend guys? Fantastic. Super. Yeah, get out to much in the sunshine? Childcare? <laughs> <laughs> Not really getting. <laughs> I, mine was also dominated Outside with the children maybe? No. Just keeping them cool. Just keeping yeah, them cool. Yeah, yeah. Keeping them hydrated. Staying very, very sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same for us all. But um, yeah, how's your summer been, I guess, to start off with? Moderately busy, sort of, sort of one couple of shows, couple of festivals here and there. Yeah, it felt pretty busy and like got to do some new ones, which was fun. We did WOMAD, which was yeah. like... We never thought as a band we'd play that festival, but it was like one of the most wholesome ones of the whole summer. It's definitely busier than the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of like, uh, obviously when we were meant to come back, sort of big summer in 2020, there was COVID and then mm. it's sort of been drips and drabs yeah. following that, but it was the first sort of getting back to normalcy. For sure. For yeah. And I did want to ask about sort of that because you got to do the tour, probably one of the last tours that happened in that March of 2020. Yeah. The album was out January. Did, did it feel like, you know, it was, it was cut short. Um, quite, did, was there like sort of unfinished business with the everything else has gone wrong era? I mean, way? yeah, the, the touring cycle for that album was definitely cut short, but I think we tried to stay positive and think about all the bands that didn't even get to do a single tour. And we did a really fun UK tour and that kind of just like, Mm. kept us going I think mm. but it was a shame not to go to the States and not to Europe and Australia and stuff yeah and sort of when touring did become possible again was was my big day sort of what stage was it at by then were you really thinking okay let, let's wrap up everything else has gone wrong first or was it sort of you know let's bring in the next thing I feel like we probably had some new songs but this was a record I'd say where it was a big rush at the end of like a couple of songs at, at the last minute which was both like exciting and nerve wracking for like <laughs> the bit before it. Yeah, there was like quite a lot at the start in 2020, early 2021, and then 18 months of not so much, and then a lot of the end, yeah. Yeah, and that gap in the middle, like the biggest sort of gap, did it, did it refresh some of the, the songs that had sort of, you know, started and got the foundations, or was it really like kind of a more of a clean slate kind of vibe? It was definitely like more, the, the whole pandemic experience was like doubly strange for us because we'd, have a, we'd had a hiatus before the album and then a pandemic after. So it was like we had this, <laughs> this big return with, with our last record and then this, this, again, another sort of forced hiatus. Um, so there were lots of like, you know, the big return shows, which was fun actually. Like when you come back after a while, like anything, it's like super exciting. This summer, a highlight, um, obviously on paper, has got to be that, that Reading secret set. Um, mm. being asked to come back after, after so many years. How, how was that for you, sort of opening the tent? Did all those emotions sort of flood back like the first few times you played? It was definitely poignant because it was like the exact slot that we played when we were teenagers, uh, except the gates were open this time. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't really anyone there at the beginning. Um, it was a funny show because it was the last of a run in which we'd done these intimate little karaoke shows with like 100 people coming on stage and singing with us and to suddenly go back to like a regular gig where no one's like coming on stage and just jumping around with us felt like a bit bizarre. But, you know, we had to return to reality at some point. Yeah. And when were you sort of asked about that Reading? How long was it really hard to sort of keep it a secret kind of thing? Uh, I can't remember. It was probably, it was a few months ago. Um, I mean, we did some cryptic things yeah. on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram beforehand, which maybe were pretty obvious, maybe more obvious than I thought because, um, there's so many like accounts that track potential <laughs> secret um, slots at major festivals and they were immediately onto it. And as you say, the karaoke, I know you've got some stuff with So Far Sounds coming up, really creative, you know, sort of ways to interact with the fans. How are you sort of enjoying, you know, doing things? Is it still keeping it fresh for you guys as well? Yeah, I think that's kind of the idea. Like the karaoke tour was, I've never, I've never 
been at a gig with such a wholesome atmosphere. <laughs> it kind of made me think like, can't every gig be like this? Like every person that came up and sung, they were treated like gods by the crowd in a super supportive, like beautiful way. I remember saying like, guys, can you be like this at all of our shows when we're just playing normally? I think we, yeah, they were very, very communal in a way that I haven't really experienced at a gig of like, everyone in the audience sort of wanting people to succeed um, and like singing along harder if they were maybe faltering a bit. Mm. Or, and I thought that was, yeah, it was like, it really reinvigorated my like love of live music, I think. Yeah, for sure. for sure. Were there any like particular highlights, particular fans that, you know, stole the show, ones, ones you think you'll be talking about for years to come? Yeah, well, there were like lots of good vocal performances, but one uh, bass performance of a song called Overdone really stood out, and I forget her name, but she was absolutely shredding on the bass and just like <laughs> grooving, and that was really cool to see. And Ed was just standing in the crowd, just like nodding his yeah. head. Which was, there, was a, there was a 10 year old girl that came on and did Always Like This as well. And she was very, she was very nervous when she came on, but was then like belting it out really <laughs> like confidently as soon as the song started. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, my big day, it's coming up very shortly. Um, how's the mood in Camp Bomber Bicycle Club ahead? Is it, is it a different build up for you guys compared to the, the five that have come before maybe? There's probably that feeling knowing that, well, I mean, to kind of touch wood now, but that we're like, we're looking forward to actually going and playing around the world to this for this record. But now that I've said that, there's going to be another <laughs> pandemic. So, I think they're all different. Um, the run up to them because the band isn't always in a different place each time, and the like broader context is different. We've had quite a long run up into this one with with four or five songs out in advance. So there's definitely been a sense of like maybe an too much anticipation. <laughs> it gets to the point where it's a bit like like just come on now let's just do it um particularly yeah. because we i mean we finished the album in april may i think so mm -hmm. we've been sitting on it for quite a long time now this is like a very interesting period for, for bands and artists and i think it this is this little feeling now is the reason why you keep making music because you've you've finished it and mastered it and it's done but no one's heard it yet and you get very nervous and you think <laughs> was that the best i can do was that all i have and that inspires you to get back in the studio immediately and start writing the next one. Yeah. And there's this little flurry of inspiration. Well, have you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting started. Yeah, getting yeah. started. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a really lovely album. I think there's, there's touches of, you know, everything else flowing, flowing into this new project, but also some sort of new experimental t territory that um, maybe Bombay Bicycle Club hasn't crossed into before. Talk me through the, I guess, studio process and I guess the fun um, you sort of had making with it and, and experimenting. It was self-produced, which we haven't done in a couple of records. I think that probably had a huge influence on it. And I think that's probably the reason you can probably hear some of my solo project on there. Like a lot of the tracks probably could be instrumentals to hip hop tunes and mm. that kind of thing. Um, there's this sort of blurred line between a beat that I'll make on like an NPC and a Bombay Bicycle Club song. And bridging that gap is like where you end up with some of these tunes in an interesting way, I think. Mm. I think we were definitely consciously trying to be a bit braver than they w we were on the previous records and saying that there were no, like nothing was off limits in terms of what could go mm. on the album, which means it can like end up feeling a little bit schizophrenic at times, but it, it, it doesn't feel safe, which I think is the most important thing, particularly when you've been doing this for like 18 years, as mm. we have, like there's, there's just no point like trying to play it safe at this point. There's yeah. like nothing to be yeah. gained from it personally, or even like commercially, to be honest with the band either. Mm. And is that where sort of that decision self-producing sort of came from, I guess, building up sort of, you, as you mentioned, sort of your solo project and now, you know, taking that full control um, with this project? Yeah, well, I, I think the thing we get from doing it ourselves and what we've realized is we're never gonna meet someone that's harder on us than we are. And that's always kind of been the case with the band. And we definitely whittle away at songs and really, really cut the fat off them. And I mean, yeah, some of the feedback to some of the songs can be quite brutal sometimes, but in mm. a good way. It's like, you know, I can't believe you've written a song this bad. Let's not ever speak of this again. And, and just like doing that enough times until the 10 songs you're left with are, are, are incredible. Yeah, and where sort of did this album get written, get recorded? Yeah, we did it really close to where we live. And mm. it's funny, there was like a, a correlation between like 
how much fun you have when you go and make a record and how like much we think it's great I think because that those records where you go off and have like the best time you fly somewhere exotic mm. and like you know, oh this is so exciting maybe actually distracts you a bit from just like honing in on what you need to do I don't know how you feel but well, I think the previous three albums, there was a lot of Jack going on like short trips somewhere to get inspired. Whereas I think this album's more been like nine to five at yeah. a small studio, just mm. like putting the hours in, which yeah. is which is like maybe not as romantic or as, like doesn't have as good stories. But um, that was also kind of the reality of a lot of it being written during COVID, I think. As well. Yeah. And sort of, now you've both got kids, as you say, like, do you, do you envisage that sort of fitting into your home life a bit more as sort of future, future projects um, in, in the way of them getting written? It's hard to say. Yeah, you're kind of just improvising the whole time, <laughs> aren't you? So, uh, yeah, maybe. Or just bring them along yeah. to some crazy place you want to go Features? and write music. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think uh, you kind of... I think Kanye West said something like, love is terrible for creativity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I, I do and don't understand because it, it like, I think one thing I've realised since having a child is like, you just can't do as much as you did before while also being like, not a terrible parent. Like, mm. you can't have it all really, is the, is the truth of it. Um, but I think it's still, it can like, inspire you creatively in other ways as well and I don't know like give you new things to write about or um, like give you a sense of purpose as well which I think is Im important um, as a band when you've been doing it for a long time to like have something to keep you driving forward. Mm. Mm, for sure. Um, I mean we have to sort of talk about the, the collaborations on this album because they're, they're, they're plenty there's lots of them four already announced um, one secret one still to come uh, but yeah what sort of um, was different for you guys this time I guess to open the door to that that level of collaboration I think that might be another sort of result of me doing my solo stuff where I did just collaborate on almost every song and you know go and work with all these singers and I really enjoyed that it was really fun to not be limited by your own voice or your own style and mm -hmm. just have complete freedom. And maybe that spilled over slightly on this record. It's certainly very eclectic, mm. which I'm really actually proud of because I think we've always tried to be quite an eclectic band. Yeah, from like Holly Humberstone to Damon Alban, it's, 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 it's a nice mix of people. And the, obviously the surprise is going to blow, blow a lot of people's minds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think, well, actually, I, I think the band has since the at least the second or third album has had quite a lot of external collaborators they've just normally mm -hmm. been like close friends of ours where it's more informal and it's not like this is a feature yeah. it's more like so there's you know the same singer singing on like five or six songs on the album um whereas this is this feels a bit more like entering the kind of pop or hip-hop sort of territory for for features mm. and without giving away the secret what was the decision behind holding one one back but revealing revealing the other four we just thought it'd be really fun to <laughs> surprise people because it is it is even if we hadn't had this big reveal it's just going to shock a lot of people and we thought why not make that into something yeah i think we wanted to reveal it visually for the first mm. time as well yeah um, okay rather than on a track listing yeah we're going to try and make a video for it and oh, brilliant. it's brilliant on, on a few then specifically, diving with Holly Humberston's already out. Um, Jack, I know you've played with Holly before and stuff. Talk me through that sort of friendship and creative relationship and when it sort of started. Yeah, so she asked me to come and sing on a song at one of her shows, which I was surprised by, but like really uh, honoured to do that. And I, I, I genuinely love her music and listen to it all the time. And um, it kind of made sense. We had this track and... It was it was probably a song that was like 80% done and there was just something missing from it and this it was just a great example of someone coming in and and it's suddenly all making sense and just being like, ah, oh, that, that's what was missing from it. And we've got Heaven featuring Damon Alban. Uh, how, how do you tie down someone like Damon who has his fingers in more projects than anyone I think I've ever seen? <laughs> with, a lot, with a lot of difficulty. <laughs> yeah, it was tricky. Oh, well, I actually went and played him the album because I, like, I value his opinion a lot. And we've worked together quite a lot leading up to this. And um, this, it was just one song where instead of him like giving me a few notes or a bit of feedback, he just like 
got his engineer to bring him a microphone and just started like singing this melody. And I was wow. like, oh, it sounds amazing. And I knew then and then like, it's kind of like a curse as well as a blessing because it's so good. But I was like, am I going to ever persuade him to actually finish this and like <laughs> write the lyrics? And so the next six months was just chasing him. Being Back like, and forth. Please, it was so good. And, you know, for him, it's just this little thing. And, but, uh, you know, credit to him. He, 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 he found some time and, and we're very, very grateful that he mm. did because we know how busy he is. Yeah. I um, think he wrote, he sort of finished it in a, on like a long journey in between Coachella and somewhere else. Yeah. Or As you do. <laughs> <laughs> and also he doesn't own a mobile phone. So it's re- it, it's not like you can just what's happened be like how the lyrics go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like a lot of layers to, <laughs> to yeah. get to that point. Well, sort of on both those tracks there, as you say, like the tracks were like nearly done and sort of there's that special something um, just added on the end. Was that sort of a theme running through the album that you got, you know, you really fleshed out of songs and then it was just sort of getting that, that yeah. final hurdle? It definitely you know, happens a lot. And actually now I'm thinking about it, maybe that's just lazy songwriting. I'm like, <laughs> uh, we'll just get someone else to sing on it and it'll be done. I can't be bothered. You just said it. we were harder on ourselves. Than yeah, <laughs> I'm obviously. I, th- I think with all the. F- I, interestingly, the kind of non feature songs were all the ones that were quite easy to finish in a way. And we mm. knew what we. Yeah, they, they probably took the least amount of time. But with the features, I think part of the appeal of at least some of them is that they were coming in as like, col- you know, songwriters or collaborators rather than mm. just coming in to sing on, on the song. So whether it was diving or. Damon or um, Jay Som on Sleepless. Those most of those songs weren't finished from our perspective when they got involved in the process, and we'd also reached the point with a lot of them where we didn't really know how to finish them ourselves. So that like having a external perspective, but also like songwriters that we respect a lot, meant that we were like able to finish them essentially. Hmm. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's it's an experimental album, as I sort of already touched on. There's some really cool you know, directions on that. I wanted to ask about Rural Radio Predicts the Rapture, just that there's just so much going on in that song and obviously no vocals. Like, how, how did you cram, I guess, so much different directions into that, that short sort of thing, just over two minutes it ends up as? <laughs> yeah, I think that's like a good representation of our mindset, as Jamie was talking about for this record, just like not really worrying too much about whether it fits or not. That's just like a minute and a half of me going a bit crazy in my studio and maybe a few albums back, we would have been a bit scared to put it out. And um, this time we were just like, actually, I love this. Let's just release it. I think mm-hmm. there'll be people out there that lo- love it too. So why not? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it sort of started as like a trap beat with some sort of Kanye West horn samples and then ended with like, I don't know, garage. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which was just like, it is, I think it's just like a moment of like silliness as well, which I think is important too. Like, cause we don't take ourselves too seriously. Mm-hmm. And that's normally not really reflected in the music to be honest. But I think that song is a good example of just being like, let's just be a bit silly with this. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it comes across brilliantly <laughs> um, in the record. And I guess on the singles, Mention Diving, My Big Day, and I Want to Be Your Only Pet too, already out. Um, I feel like all three of them so far really got that, you know, quintessentially like catchy, hooky, Bombay, Bombay feel to them. I mean, um, on guitar specifically, I guess like the riff of I Want to Be Your Only Pet and then kind of the stabby bits in My Big Day, just did, did, it, did it feel like, you know, the guitar sort of serving to like elevate them in the way that I guess it comes across maybe to me as a listener. I think it's probably the best guitar playing on any of our records, which is but which is kind of um, maybe a bit surprising because a lot of the songs don't have any guitars on them, mm-hmm. <laughs> or not very many guitars on them, and it's you know we're not like uh, as straightforward an indie rock band as we were on mm. our first three records where we were predominantly like a two guitars, bass and drums band with some sprinkles on top. But I think there's some really creative guitar playing on it and there's like quite a lot of guitar solos as well, yeah. which is new new ground for us. Yeah, that's um, a first for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely the one I'm 
most proud of in terms of the guitar parts. Yeah, and is it nice sort of, you know, picking and choosing where they come in their moments? Because as you say, there will, there will be people who think Bobby Bicycle Club has quintessentially a guitar band, yeah. but there's obviously so much more than that now, but the guitars still have their moments, as you say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think we should be clear when we say guitar solos, we're not like yeah. Guns N' Roses over here. Right? <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty long guitar solo. <laughs> it's funny because this is a period where we haven't actually played the album live, but just even talking about that makes me so excited to go and, and you know, shred, shred on stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, I want to sort of talk about a lot of the stuff on social media you've been putting out, you know, clips from the archives, really like, you know, looking back at... Are you guys feeling nostalgic as, as such at the minute? Um, because I know, like, so playing the playing the older older tracks live. I know when you did them, um, uh, the blues in full. It must have sort of rolled back the years a bit. Yeah, it's tr it's tricky. You have to find a balance between like a nice amount of nostalgia, which everyone loves, and I, it's very easy to do too much of it when you're in a situation like ours. I think. Yeah, I don't think we've done too much nostalgia on on social media. It's something we've been conscious of not doing too much of because you see a lot on like TikTok where it's bands being like, do you remember us from back in 2009? Which I think, I, I think nostalgia is like the enemy of like creativity and progress, <laughs> to be honest. And I think with the way that streaming works, like you're, there's every, so much of like music ecosystem now services people's nostalgia. So I think you have to constantly fight against that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's true. When you get recommended things on Spotify, it's always like, do you remember listening to this when you were a teenager? <laughs> and that's even more pronounced for us because we were like a teenage band that a lot of people grew up with as teenagers, which is a very important phase in people's lives. And then we went on hiatus for five years. So it's like mm. kind of stuck in time for some people to some extent, which, is, which makes it even more important to, to like emphasize that there is like something worthwhile now with the band. Yeah, and I know Jack, you just mentioned that the live shows, you're really looking forward to them. How's, how's sort of things shaping up? Is it, is it something you really, you know, sit down and think about production, <laughs> well, we, tour, everything like that? We just had our first production meeting and the, the, the first thing that was discussed was a giant bouncy castle. Beautiful. So that's, where, that's, where, that's where we're currently at. <laughs> Work in progress. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that, I mean, I think with this album generally, whether it's on social media or with the live show or whatever, I think the idea generally is to just be a bit more lighthearted and silly. Like, like we are um, in our personal lives yeah. with each other, but... As I said earlier, I don't think that's ever really been part of like the band's like image um, mm -hmm. with people. And I think also inspired by the karaoke shows that we were talking about earlier as well, more sort of like interactive and uh, like uh, surprising. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 And if you're on stage, like not feeling self-conscious and, and letting your natural self shine, then that's so contagious for the crowd. And that's what you want. You want everyone to come and just not feel embarrassed mm. and just, yeah, just do whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great, like, on the social media and stuff to, like, get that level of, like, personal interaction connect, especially as you've been away for a while, you know, like, it's really sort of nice to have those nuggets every day, whether it's older clips, new videos, yeah. um, new covers as well. I was going to ask mm. Jack, it's Sunday, the Sunday cover slot. Um, how, how are you picking and choosing those? The requests, the DMs must be flooded with requests. I now. look through the requests and I just <laughs> completely ignore them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I do actually have to start doing some that people ask for. But yeah, Jamie usually just texts me and says, how about this one? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Um, we get some unusual requests, but... Uh, I think the deft tone we did we did a deft tone yeah, cover, which has kind of a thing, it's been a thing on TikTok for a while anyway. But we actually were young enough at the time to enjoy, <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy deft tones when they actually no, that's not true. We were about seven when that song came out. So <laughs> when, yeah, but when I remember listening there. to that record at your house. Oh, yeah, yeah, but when we were like teenagers, I yeah. guess. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's no. Uh, just do what we feel like, basically. Yeah, yeah. And is it sort of a testing ground for covers in the live set? I know Selena Gomez is, has, been a, has been a theme across the summer. I'm actually, yeah, I've got an idea for a mashup that we might do, uh, which I am going to test out on one of those Sunday things. The dreaded 
the most dreaded phrase in the English <laughs> dictionary <laughs> mashup. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, well, we look forward to it. Listen, thanks for your time. Um, any any celebration plans for my big day on the twentieth of October itself, or still still to be figured out? I mean, we're so busy that week. We're, <laughs> we'll doing, sort of two, we're doing sort of two or three gigs a day that week, so um, I don't think we're going to have time to <laughs> celebrate. In a record store somewhere yeah. in the We'll UK. be toasting the Rolling Stones, number one, yeah. on the, um, 27th of October. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I hope it goes well. Really appreciate your time today. My big day is out on the 20th of October, and have a good rest of your week. Cheers.